Now today we're dealing with an air fuel sensor. Now in this case we're dealing with P153, 154, and 155. That is the sensor located at bank two, sensor one. I'll explain what that means in a moment. So in this specific vehicle, which is an 06 Acura, the sensor lives right here. So in this case, we're dealing with bank two, sensor one. Now very quickly, you just saw that we used Google images to track down the sensor. That's probably your best bet to find the sensor on your vehicle. If you still have trouble, try visiting a forum that deals specifically with your vehicle. You may have very, very good success. Option three is purchase a repair manual specific for your vehicle, and you'll find every single sensor in that repair manual. So that being said, very quickly, before we begin, what does bank two sensor one mean? Well, bank two simply means the driver's side of the engine. Now, this is a transverse mounted engine. Essentially, it's mounted sideways. So, you know, what's driver's side? Which side is that? Driver's side is the front, okay? So the radiator side, the front of the vehicle would be bank two. Bank one is the passenger side. That's a completely different sensor, different trouble code altogether, which we'll do in a couple days nonetheless. So bank two, driver's side, bank one, passenger side. Sensor one means before the catalytic converter, okay? Now on this vehicle and most other vehicles, there's a sensor right after the catalytic converter. So that would be bank two, sensor two. Different trouble code. This is bank two, sensor one, okay? Also known as an upstream. Upstream is before the cat, downstream is after the cat. Now testing these sensors are quite simple and you can do this on most vehicles. So take a look at the sensor. As you can see, it hooks up to a harness connector. Now most vehicles will have the harness connector attached to a metal tab, as you can see here. And it's very, very, secured on this tab and sometimes it, it can be a little tricky figuring out how to remove this without breaking that plastic tab but in this case right where my middle finger is if I push out toward the vehicle in other words toward the firewall of the vehicle push this out and then push down okay so all I'm doing is pushing the tab back here and that's it. Now I just need to disconnect this and we will check to see what's going on with this sensor. Right here, there's a tab where my thumb is. You can hear it click. So hold down that tab and pull on the body. There you go. Now you can test this sensor while it's still attached to the vehicle. I'm going to remove it just so I can place it on the bench, give you better lighting. And also I'll need a little bit more working room to get everything on the camera, which you'll see in a moment. Now, in some vehicles, you may be lucky that you can maybe slip a very, very long socket. In this case, it wouldn't work, the wire's too long. But years ago, we did one on a Maxima, and we were able to fit a socket. Sometimes you can fit a wrench, but on modern vehicles, as you can see, very, very little working room, you can just purchase an oxygen sensor socket. These are inexpensive, nine, $10. This I purchased off Amazon. I'll include a link in the description box below if you do need one of these. Very simply, as you can see, it's a 7 8 of an inch adapter. That's the common size for these sensors. And then you just fit a half inch drive into this opening. Now these can tend to be incredibly, incredibly tight. So what I tend to use is a breaker bar to remove these. Now, of course, this is a breaker bar. As you can see, it provides a much, much longer handle as opposed to just using the ratchet. Now, again, we're dealing with half inch drive. Here is my extension, and we'll simply get this off the vehicle quite easily. Now, one thing to note, if you are going to remove the sensor and the exhaust is warm, wait until it cools down because obviously when you remove the sensor, it will be very, very warm. So simply place in in this case, I have my extension, and this is a wobbly extension that I have. I don't have another straight extension, but this will be perfectly fine. Now, it's always a good idea if you can to use a breaker bar just because these can be incredibly, incredibly tight, especially in this case, it's been on there for 13 years. Let's just give it a good tug. Make sure that's securely on here. Okay, and there you go. 
go ahead remove your adapter we'll place it to the side here and this just simply comes out and like I was stating earlier if your engine is hot you have to wait until this cools down because you will burn your hand on this and there is your sensor now testing the sensor is quite simple what you need is a digital multimeter this happens to be twenty dollars off Amazon if you happen to need one I'll include a link in the description box below ultimately you have a number of different settings that, that you can uh, choose from on the multimeter in this case we need to do a resistance or an ohms test that is the Omega symbol on the multimeter now every meter comes with two leads or I should say they come with two leads you have a black lead, let me show you. You have a black lead and a red lead. So all that you do is plug in the leads. And then, again, turn on your multimeter to the resistance setting. Now an average reading is 2 to 4 ohms for most vehicles. Let me readjust this so you can see it. 2 to 4 ohms at room temperature, meaning in this case, the garage is around 50 degrees Fahrenheit, so the reading will be higher. If you're doing this in the summertime, it's very, very hot outside, your reading will be a little bit lower. But ultimately, if you do this test and you don't receive a reading, then the sensor is bad, and you pinpointed where the problem is. Now, it's always a good idea to test the sensor, even if you have, if you have the check engine light on, because you may have a problem elsewhere, meaning the wiring, and I'll go over that in a moment. So as you can see, you have a number of different prongs in here. And in my case, I need to set up prong number one here on the left, and then prong number two. Now, how do I know that? Well, really, you can use trial and error. And I'll show you that in a moment. Where are my uh, leads here? Now, you don't have to use alligator clips. I'm just using them because it makes it easier. But here we go. Let's see what kind of reading we have. Now, watch the multimeter. Again, 2 to 4 ohms is average at room temperature. Here it's a little colder, so we have 5.6 ohms. This is in perfect working shape. Again, if you do this and you don't receive a reading, it's no good. If you do this test and the reading is incredibly high, incredibly, incredibly high, it's also not good. So you want to be, again, in that 2 to 4 ohms at room temperature. Now, how do I know which prongs to touch? Well, again, just do trial and error. So if I just disconnect this, and I start touching the other prongs, no reading, no reading. So in other words, you can do trial and error and figure out which ones you need to touch. But ultimately, again, if you sort of plan on doing this, a lot of times you could dig up online which two prongs you need to touch or just purchase the repair manual for your vehicle and it will explain exactly which two prongs to touch but again you could just do trial and error and that's it that's all it takes to test the sensor now in my case this is in perfectly good shape I'm just doing this video as a how-to but let's also test one other thing now there is one more test to verify this is working or not working and that's a continuity test that just means two points make a connection okay now in the multimeter you want to find the setting it looks like a Wi-Fi hotspot this symbol right here Okay, so that's the setting you want to be on. Now, on the first test, we, we already know that number one and number two here make a connection because we received the readout. So we know that makes a connection, and just to verify that, I'll quickly show you. And again, you don't have to use alligator clips, but take my word on this. It just makes it a lot easier with the alligator clips. Okay, so we should have continuity here. Make sure I get this on right. Okay, here we go. Okay, so there's your continuity. But the other prongs, which did not produce a reading, should have no continuity. So again, nothing. Zero. No continuity. So you just want to test the other prongs to see if there's continuity. If there is, the sensor is bad. Oop, that was me touching that top one by accident. There we go. Okay, so you just want to do this test as well. But let's say, for example, you do this test, and the sensor is fine, but you do have a check engine light on your vehicle. What else can you check? 
Now before I reinstall the sensor, I'm just applying just a touch of anti-seize compound. Very simply, I just use a Q-tip and just place it back on here. Now if you do have to replace the sensor, the new sensor will have a little plastic cap and when you remove that you'll find anti-seize compound on there already. But if you're reinstalling your old sensor, just make sure you use some of this anti-seize compound. It's good stuff. And typically these will go bad if they're just clogged up. If your vehicle is slowly burning coolant or engine oil, this will clog up and just go bad. But typically if your car runs very well, these can last for a very, very long time. And before you reinstall the sensor, just make sure you don't touch the end of the sensor with your hands. We'll just slowly bring this back in here and tighten it up. And again, I'm just using the adapter. Okay. The flip side is if you plan on doing this only once and you don't want to invest the 10 bucks or so to purchase the, uh, that's it, that's enough, uh, the tool, a lot of times you can just rent them for, uh, for nothing from your local auto parts store. And then we just simply reconnect the sensor. Okay, make sure it clicks, reinstall it on the tab, and that's it. Now let's say that the sensor, you test it, it's working perfectly fine but you still have a check engine light. What else can you check? Well, let's check the fuse. Now, most modern vehicles have a fuse specific for the air fuel sensor. Now, again, typically you have to find it. In this case, it's inside the cabin because there's also another fuse box underneath the hood of the vehicle, which I'll show you in a moment. But just remove the cover and rotate it. And let's see what we have here. So number four, you see where it says LAF? That's the air fuel sensor, which is this guy right here. Let me grab a puller. Now many vehicles include a fuse puller. Now in this case, it's located at the other fuse box underneath the hood. So this is the under hood fuse box. And this is the, uh, the fuse puller, okay? So now we'll check that fuse with the puller. If you don't have one of these, you can use, of course, needle nose pliers. Just be gentle with it. There we go. And just take a look at the arc. As you can see, this is in perfect fine shape. But if there's a break at that arc, then your fuse is blown, and that's the problem. That's it. Let me also show you one other fuse you can check. So now we're back to the under hood fuse box. Let me place this back in its holder. And there's a fuse that is for the ECU, or the vehicle's computer. Now if this fuse is blown, not only would you have a trouble code for that air fuel sensor, but also a number of other sensors. Chances are your car won't even run. But nonetheless, good idea to check anyway. So as you can see here on the back cover, number 19 is the ECU. It's a 40 amp. That's this guy right here. And this sensor is in good shape. If this is blown, then if you're lucky, that's all that it is and you're done. But that being said, these things are sort of remote. If you have a check engine light on, chances are that sensor is just not working anymore. I mean, that, that's the bottom line. But that being said, always a good idea to check all, all of these things, especially if the vehicle was in a collision, if there was a flood. Always a good idea to backtrack everything. Now the last thing is we'll start the vehicle and I'll show you on how you can verify that's working correctly. the sensor while the car is running is quite simple. You need a scan tool that can process live data. This is a $40 scan tool off Amazon. You can also rent one typically from your local auto parts store. If you're not familiar with these, every vehicle from 1996 and onwards has the same hookup. You just plug it into the vehicle and you're ready to rock and roll. So we need to find live data on the machine, which is right here, data stream. And what we want to look for is the air fuel sensor. This may say oxygen sensor, which is essentially the same thing. Uh, air fuel sensor just can read wider and leaner bands better than an O2 sensor. But nonetheless, just look for the air fuel or oxygen sensor specific 
for bank two, sensor one. That's the key thing we need to find. So as you can see, there's a number of things you can do with these scan tools. Intake air temp, okay, here's oxygen sensor, bank one, sensor two, we don't want that. Bank one, sensor two, bank two, sensor two, no good, no good, there we go. Oxygen sensor current, bank two, sensor one. Let's choose that. We should see a reading. And as you can see, this is working correctly. Now you can always just quickly jump to this before even removing the oxygen sensor or the air fuel sensor. That's perfectly fine if you have a scan tool. If you do not, you can use the technique that I showed, removing it and testing it with a digital multimeter. And that's all it really takes to really pinpoint where the problem is. So I hope this helps a number of you out there. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.